fell in the water, but we're not going to talk about drifting today. Um, we have with us Bill Drea, Quantum Sales, Mike Constantine, UK Sales, and they're here to answer any questions that you might have on sale techniques, your sale, what, how it works for you, what, how you could better improve your sale shape, what effect that would have on your sale and the condition and you. So ask away because it's your opportunity to find out all the secrets from the sale makers. Right? Correct. Right. I'll let you guys take it. All right. And please feel free to ask questions. Okay. I'll start because um, someone asked, just asked me a question. Uh, they put up their new sale today and they're like, oh yeah, the shape, it looked uh, pretty draft forward and really straight in the back end and really deep. And, uh, there, and I said, my response was, well, you know, there's no wind, not much pressure on it. Once you, you know, you're never bending the mass, you're not putting anything on, not putting any Cunningham on. So I said, once you put it up in some pressure, and see the sail, it'll look exactly like what you're used to seeing, just because it hasn't, um, there's no wind, so the sail really isn't going to look great in that zero wind flying shape. So once you have a little bit of pressure on the sail and you're sailing with it, it'll kind of form into the shape that it needs to form into. Yeah, that's good. I, I think... You know, all, all the sail makers that are active in this class, they, they build really good sails. There's some slight differences, and that's where the sail maker can work with you on the tuning guide and get the initial setup. But more important than that is just kind of understanding what the what the controls on the boat do. And um, the MC mass is pretty bendable fore and aft, and you have a number of ways either to induce bend or to control bend. The first thing you do is you set your spreader sweep based on what your sailmaker says. If you have more spreader sweep, your mast will more easily bend. If you straighten your spreader sweep, the mast will stay straighter a little longer. But there's a couple other controls that have a huge, huge effect on how the mast bends, and that's the main sheet tension and the vang tension. You can simply, with main sheet tension, turn just about any sail inside out, and that is get it so flat that it's finally beyond flat. You can also do the same thing with the bang. You have enough control on the bang that you can either not have enough bang or pull the bang on so hard that you turn the sail inside out. So really how to make a sail look good in all ranges is to get a good visual on the sail and decide have I cheated too hard or not hard enough or have I banged too hard or not hard enough because those controls will give you the ability to do just about anything with the sail. Well, can you talk about using the travel? Yeah, um, and then and then you talk about the travel after me. I mean, there's different people have different techniques. A um, lot a lot of people coming out of lasers, and they're 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 more bang shooters where they they get least tension through the bang, and then they quite aggressively move the main sheet in and out to depower the boat. I, on the other hand, I'm I'm lazy, so I don't bang quite as hard. Some people. And when I get pops and I get overpowered, I, I drop the traveler, and I'll drop the traveler all the way to the bottom of the of the boat, and adjust the traveler up and down quite a bit through the wind ranges. But both um, techniques work, and I, and I think Michael suggests that he sails differently. Yeah, well, when I normally w I would always be a bank cheater, but um, then getting into this class for sure, I started doing the traveler a little bit more. Um, but so I'm kind of in between. Sometimes if it's really blowing hard and then it's at the level and if I don't have a crew and I need to depower, I'll be, I might set the traveler so that when I'm tacking, it's going down a certain amount um, and not play and then obviously play it if I need some more power, pull it back up. But, um, you know, initially I was more of a bang cheater, but uh, sailing this boat to learn that the traveler is, uh, you know, it, it definitely helps a lot. So I. I kind of go in between banging hard and traveling down a lot as well. And obviously, if you're dropping your traveler down that far, then you should be kicking your board up too. So, um, um, yeah, so when I get, when my traveler's going down, then I'm working on kicking my board up just a little bit as well. And I think the key is that you just yeah, have like to understand, much. oh, go ahead. Oh, Jeff was asking. Oh, I just wanted to sum there. that last one up. I think you just have to have the understanding of what you're trying to accomplish when you get overpowered. When you get a buff, 
you want to exhaust the leech of the sail. And you exhaust the leech, you'll have to let the leech go to leeward. If that'll spill wind off the sail, you can do it either way. You can drop the main sheet down quite far and get the leech to exhaust, or you can drop the traveler down and the leech will exhaust. So they both, both, both do the, kind of the same thing. In what kind of winds do you actually bring up your boards? Just to give everybody an example, you're saying you have to spill wind. Oh, yeah. I don't drop the board, but but he'll tell you how he does. Um, yeah, well, it, I, I usually mean, do I'll it. Raise the board. Yeah, I, I usually do it when uh, if I don't have a crew um, and I'm really overpowered. It's probably about uh, um, it might be about 15 knots. It might be a little before that at times when I'm sailing by myself. Um, if I had a crew, then I, I don't have a lot of experience sailing with a crew, so I have, don't really know what I, where to do it with a crew. But, um, you know, what I do, it's all kind of, and everything we're doing with the traveler, the vang, and depowering, it's the feel you have on the helm. So pulling the boards up, sometimes it gets rid of that feel on the helm, and the boat still tracks about the same. Sometimes you lose just a little bit of point, but you're able to depower and go faster. So um, so I'll kick the board, and you, you, don't, and you might not actually lose point as far as, um, angle of attack or what you're tracking through the water, but just by kicking the board up just a hair, you might go sideways a little bit more, but you're going faster and not, you know, you just get rid, you just get rid of that helm. So, um, you know, so I'll just kick it up a little bit and I'll play with it to feel on the helm when I'm sailing by myself. Um, Ron, just for clarification, you're you're not kicking your board up when it's. When, it's, when there's a lot of gear changing going on, right? It's only kind of when it gets a real consistent. Yeah, it has to be pretty breeze. solid. I'm not, getting it back down is a pain. Is a yeah, problem. yeah, I'm not adjusting the board up and down for sure. Definitely not. But sometimes, you know, if it's where I'm just starting to get overpowered, I might kick it up a little bit, and it, it helps. So, um, and I'll just leave it. And I have the uh, the boards where they're below deck, so you don't really know where it's at. So sometimes I'll just give it a little tug, so I'm not sure exactly what my angle is, but I'll just, or I, or when I go to drop it and pull it down, I might stop it so it doesn't pull down all at, right at the end, so it's not all the way down. So I'm not sure exactly my angle. I'm kind of going by feel. So what so. do you do? Uh, put, put the board up just a little bit. What does that do for you? Um, well, what what is what the first thing I notice is that it gets rid of the helm and the boat starts tracking. I don't have to feather and I don't have a it just depowers um, the load on the boat a little bit. Are you trying to make the helm totally neutral or are you keeping a little bit? Of no, I like to have a little bit. You know, you want to have helm for sure. I mean, and it, that depends on what people think. But I mean, if you have a helm, that means you agree with it. Gets boat going up wind. So I like to have a little bit of helm, but not a lot. If you have a lot of helm then you have a problem. Bill, do you agree a little bit of weather helm upwind? Well, um, yeah, you're probably always going to have a little helm. I mean, if you take it to extreme, if you're always looking for, if you were only looking for zero helm, like you blow the main sheet and the sail starts luffing, you're at zero helm, but you're not going to go forward. But just to kind of wrap up his point, I think part of the reason we sail differently as it relates to the lured board is he sails a lot single-handed. Marianne and I show up at all the regattas together, so... When he feels the need to be overpowered, when he's overpowered and the need to depower by pulling the board up, that's a way to depower. I'm typically putting Marianne on, on the boat, so I, I solve the overpowered problem by putting another person on the boat. We sail together, we're typically weighing about 290 pounds. But what do you do, Bill, when you didn't get married and you're suddenly <laughs> overpowered? You cry. <laughs> I was told that by raising the board, especially in choppy conditions, it helps you to get through the chop better. Is that true? Well, it might help yes. you steer around the chop or just allow you to hold more power without being kind of bound up. You know? So sometimes, sometimes it just if you can if you could have more power by keeping the bow down and not having the helm rounding you know rounding you up, it'll keep you power going through the waves better. So pulling the board down will keep, allow you to hold your bow down and keep the power in the boat. Bow down being the key word. Bow down, yes. And that's a real important thing when you had a crew, which Bill could say, which I've learned, you know, tried to, but if you could hold your bow down and go fast, um, you'll, 
you know, that's got, it's really about speed, and you can get a lot more speed, especially when the breeze comes up. So Bill said his crew weight is 290. What's, what's your hope? Mary Ann weighs 290? <laughs> what? Right, well, right now, right now it's uh, 185. I'll say, or maybe 180. I'll say okay, so does that have any bearing or effect on the type of sail that you sail? Or do the conditions that you're sailing in have any bearing on the type of sail you pull? Because some people have a sail um, loft in the back of their car. You know, sure. they have a heavy air sail. What is the best... Well, yeah, I could, I mean, yeah, I could have multiple sails if I wanted to. I use one sail, um, and, you know, we, we do make different shapes, and I don't know, I, a lot of other people make multiple shapes, um, but I use our AP almost exclusively. Um, we do have a heavier sail that's for guys that never had a crew. It's a flatter sail, and, you know, for when the breeze comes on, um, and we have a deeper sail for that would be great in a choppy condition. So like, I might even consider the deeper sail for myself for Lake Geneva, because it's gonna be a choppy lake. But um, but anyway, I typically use one sail and, the, and it's the majority, you know, even the majority of the sails we sell are that one sail to big guys, to small guys and everybody, and everyone make, figures out how to make it work for most of those ranges. So the, do you, have you found that the, the lighter crew that they swept the, uh, swipe the <clears throat> spreaders back further to bend the mass more? To, um, to, they yeah. need power earlier? Has anybody said they've been doing that? Um, well, the one thing with spreader sweep is uh, not everybody can, tr can control their spreader sweep. So um, the most of the boat, the standard is like four and a half is when you measure a straight line. It's like four to four and a half from a straight line from, when you connect the spreaders from the back of the mast. And um, that's a lot of them only have one. Well, they do have two, two spots, but two the position. forward one is way forward. So they only have the four. So the four and a half is like the most common. So our sale, our AP is made for to go for that. I mean, I prefer to set it a little myself personally a little further forward from there to like three and three quarters, maybe or three and a half. And what that does is a little bit is help control the mass bend. Um, but these masts are pretty whippy, and once you put bang on and pull on the main sheet, they bend pretty sim pretty similar. So it only controls it a little bit. And the other thing I do is I tighten my shrouds a little tighter than most people as well, and that kind of stiffens the rig up a little bit. Is your AP the PS one? Yes. Yeah. Bill. Uh, yeah, as long as you're talking about spreader sweep, that there's um, some some of the boats had infinitely adjustable turnbuckles, and in that case, you can put the spreader sweep wherever you want. The standard bracket from Melgis has two hole positions on the spreader. The aft position with more sweater, spreader sweep puts you, you know, about four and a half inches of sweep, like uh, Mike said. The forward hole puts you at about three and a half inches of spreader sweep, which is where we, we put our spreaders for our sale. Um, so it's, you can get there by just having the standard bracket or by using the turnbuckles. And to go back to your question earlier about different sales and different conditions, yeah, pretty much all our customers just use our all-purpose sail. We, I haven't sold a heavy air sail in a number of years. It will help you sail in breeze, but you have to relate it to how much better are you going to do with a heavy air sail relative to adding crew. And, and you'll be slightly better if you go to a heavy air sail, but because of the way scout classes work, you're way better off by just using the AP sail and having the ability to put crew on when it gets windy. Okay. Bill, do you, uh, or Mike, do you uh, use overbend wrinkles to tell you when you've trimmed far enough or flattened the mast far enough, or, or bent the mast far enough, I mean? Go ahead, Mike. What are overbend um, Okay, overbend wrinkles are when you um, either put your bang on or pull your main sheet on, you'll see diagonal wrinkles coming out of the luff and kind of going towards the clue. They're diagonal wrinkles. So what and what causes that is when you bend the mast more than you have luff curve to support the curvature of the mast bend and depth in the sail, it turn it over flattens the sail. Um, so yeah, so that's the indicator of knowing how far, like if you have your main sheet on so hard that you got these wrinkles in, then your main sheet is too hard. You're trimming the sail too tight. And if your vang is pulled on that hard, 
then your sail is, uh, your bang is on too hard because you've over flattened it. Um, although there, so that's a good indicator for when to stop putting bang on and that's your max T power mode. Um, although I have at times really wailed on the bang and uh, there's something that you call inverting the sail. And um, that's where um, you have, you pulled all the shape out of it and then the leech actually dumps off to lure. And um, um, because you've taken 100%, more than 100% of the shape out of the sail, so the cloth can't support the shape. And sometimes when you're super duper overpowered um, and just try it, I've done that and it's fast. So, but only for a brief period of time. So, um, so you can do that, but normally you don't want to do that. Bill, come in. Yeah, I think you described over band wrinkles just right. And again, the, the, having those two controls, the main sheet and the bang, tell you when this, the fact when this, you start seeing over band wrinkles, is time to stop pulling on those two controls. Okay. When you see the aluminum bending, that's probably another yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you said that's a short period of time. Does that mean that when you're done, you have to buy a new sail? No. Uh, it doesn't really affect the sail. Oh. Um, okay. It's just, uh, you know, basically what happens when, when you have your sail inverted, so the leech, you have it bent, totally flattened out, the leech actually dumps off to lure. So that's going to depower you a lot, right? Uh, plus the sail's flat as a board flat as a board um, but the problem is then when you need the leech tension to help you go somewhere you don't have it so um, like when we race on boats that have hydraulic backstays or whatever sometimes we might get to that level get to where the sail is turned inside out and then ease the backstay off just enough to see the leech get firm and uh, that's when we know that's the maximum amount that we've laid the sail on so you can sort of do the same thing on an MC although it's you know, I don't think any. You probably can't. It's really you got to pull really hard to get the to completely invert an MC bay and get the leech up and up. But you can probably. I'm guessing. But, I mean, I have, but uh, you know, not, not many people pull on the bang that hard. It's hard hard to get under the boom when you have the bang on that hard too. Don't go around the bar. <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah, just. Or Scott. I mean, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, like in conditions. Like if the wind had come in a little bit today, you know, so you're on the low side and uh, very, very light wind. Talk about the how you guys use the alcohol. Do you, have, do you like it tight or do you like it loose? And it's um, really, really light. Yeah, well, when it's super light, uh, I mean, I, I just pull, I almost always have the, I don't rarely ever have like wrinkles in my foot, but I'll just pull it so the foot tape or the bolt rope is just snug, still have the shape in the foot. Um, you know, I mean, theory is in light air that you want flatter sails because you want, but, uh, but then the other theory is that, well, we want more power in the sails too, to get us moving. So, um, I just pulled for the outhaul. I just pull it just, uh, just snug. And that's like my lowest setting that I go with it. Yeah. I'll, um, again, if it's blowing zero to two, which it was out there, the air molecules have trouble going around it. A deep curb so I'll pull the outhaul pretty flat if it's flowing between zero and two but then pretty quickly after that I'll ease the outhaul so that the shelf fully opens up we put a lot of power in the bottom of the sail and then um, as we start getting overpowered at uh, say it's blowing 10 or 11 or something then I'll pull the outhaul tight again so it goes from pretty tight to fully open to power up until we're getting overpowered and then then pulling the outhaul on again as soon as you have any kind of breeze, but you know, it starts five, then you're going to pop it back open. Going to fully yeah. open the yeah, shelf yeah. of the, you know, a lot of trouble to put the shelves in these sails. It takes us time and effort, and, and <laughs> there's a reason we put it in there. I mean, it induces a lot of power, and you're not overpowered, so ease your out all off. I mean, typically in sailing in general, in a lot of classes, people will mis make the mistake of just pulling the out haul really tight all the time going upwind, but if you're not overpowered, you, you want to use that power available through the shelf foot. Do you, do you feel like you lose any height though if you get too much depth in the sail? No, I mean because you're, uh, as the sail gets deeper, it makes the leech return to weather a little more, and anytime you have a tighter leech, it helps you point, so absolutely not. So, question. 
No, no, not enough mushrooms. No, no, no. Sail me. Okay. I was always told when you get a new sail, after a while the bolt rope shrinks, and you're supposed to undo the stitching. Yeah. What about along the boom? Um, if you can't get the foot tight, you probably should undo the boom stitching. But I've never really run into a problem where you can't get the foot tight. But we do all the time where the bluff rope gets too tight, and we don't even, or I don't think we do now. But um, I think now we're using shock cord. But I always left the stitching at the tack on the on the luff rope loose uh -huh. so it could shrink up in there. But I don't really, I haven't really noticed a problem along the foot. Have you, Paul? No, not, I mean, occasionally you might see that. But, I mean, that's not, uh, yeah, we usually don't really ever have to release a foot rope. There's a lot more load, you know, the load, there's a lot of load on the, you know, with the halyard and the Cunningham and you, when you really pull on the Cunningham, so that's what helps cause them to stretch and then they want to shrink up. So, after being stretched, they want to shrink back. What are the uh, most important cell controls, the uh, Cunningham? Yeah, I don't know if it's the most important, <laughs> but it, it matters, you know, a, as, you know, we've been talking a lot about how, yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about how easily the, the mask bends, right? And when, and when, the, and when the mask bends, you, you're effectively moving the maximum position of draft further back in the sail because you're pulling the shape out of the front of the sail. The Cunningham counters that. When you pull the Cunningham down, it helps to pull the draft back more towards the middle of the sail. So you will kind of increase in Cunningham tension as the mass bend increases, and that's how to use the Cunningham. And for sure, you shouldn't be using it in uh, real light stuff. Like Mike said early, when the guy went out there in no breeze, the mass is dead straight, the, the draft is already way forward. So you don't touch the Cunningham until you start bending the mast. Mike? Um. Yeah, I agree. Pretty much the same thing. Um, one thing, though, uh, on these boats and some other boats, uh, you know, these boats of Cunningham probably helps your mass bend a little bit once you're, because when you pull on the Cunningham, it compresses the halyard, and then it's going to make the mass bend a little more. Um, in fact, that, like on the Sea Scout, that's one of the controls to help bend the mass, although they, they're bent, they're rigged, they're a little bendier because they bend sideways. But, um, but anyway, so the, the cutting admin is also going to kind of control, induce more mass bend as well. Okay, so where's the optimum draft position on the sail? Is it forward? In certain air conditions, is it different? You want the draft to move forward or back, say, in heavier or lighter wind? Yeah, I'll try first. I mean, maybe a little bit. I mean, you might be, you know, you, typically it'll be about in the middle of the sail. You might try to get it forward of that when it's kind of lumpy conditions. Might be okay if it's a, you know, um, you don't ever really want it to drift aft of 50%, but, um, you know, generally trying to keep the max depth position in the middle of the sail. Does it matter what type of sail? Like if you have a, a full cut sail, does it matter versus a flat cut sail? Or no? I don't think so. What's your thought on the um, max well, position? Draft? Yeah, well, you know, the, the draft in, in a normal. In a mainsail on a normal boat, the draft on a main, it's going to be 40 to 45 percent is about where it's going to be designed into the sail. But this is not a, and I'm, when I say a normal boat, I mean a boat with a jib or a Genoa. Well, these don't have that, so the draft is going to be a little further forward than the design sh design shape that's been 40 or 45 percent. So, um, but only a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, are you going to move it around? Is it better for some conditions? Yeah, maybe if it's really blowing, it's a little bit better further forward. Because if the, when you move the draft forward, it makes the leech more open and further more straight. When it moves back, it makes the leech more round. So there might be some good conditions where you want the draft to be back a little bit. Let's say it's light and choppy, and you want to get a little more power in the boat. Draft aft might be okay. But... Um, you know, I mean, it's really, you know, you don't have a lot of, we don't really have a lot of controls. We, I mean, we have some controls that move the shape around, but they're really more for the feel. I mean, the biggest control is going to, to move our shape in the main is going to be the bang. When we put the bang on, it's going to bend the mass, and the draft is going to move aft. Even if we pull Cunningham on, it'll pull it forward, but that's really the only control we have to move the draft on, on this boat. A little bit with the outhaul, it'll flatten out the lower part. 
and it might affect the, the position, but not a lot. So really the Vang and the Cunningham is all we have. So. Yeah, and, and, and I think as I was speaking a little earlier, the, the, the relative importance of the Cunningham is kind of down down the list. You talking about moving the draft around a little bit with the Cunningham, but I mean, your most powerful control is the main sheet. And if you ease the main sheet, uh, unload the back end of the sail, the draft moves way forward in the sail. And if you tighten the main sheet and you start to hook the leech, the, the draft now moves back in the sail. So yeah, I wouldn't spend a lot of time tweaking the Cunningham and trying to find max um, draft position. I just sort of not use it um, until the mass is starting to bend and then continually put it on. Um, but realizing that it's kind of down the priority list of, of, of controls. Sure. Anybody else have any questions? Scott. All right, so when you're not overpowered, where do you like your traveler? Well, when I keep it in the center almost all the time until I get overpowered. I know, um, although on my boat it's set up where if it's light air, it can get pulled to windward. But I, I, I didn't set it up that way, and I don't use it that way. But, it, uh, but John Porter, he loves to pull the traveler to windward when he's sitting on the leeward side, and he's a bigger guy like you, and he likes that. But myself, I would never do that. I, so um, so, so uh, when I'm not overpowered, it's in, in the center. Um, we're in the center sometime when we're not overpowered, but I'm not even afraid to be a couple, in, couple inches down of the center line when we're not overpowered. Our friend Greg Gust won, I think, three nationals in this class. He never put the traveler on the center. He's always down a couple inches. And I think you have to look at cat rig boats a little differently than sloop rig boats. Sloop rig boats, you know, the wayfarer with the jib, you got to keep the boom on center, if you can, to keep the slot open between the jib and the main. But we have a cat rig boat, and the boat has trouble going forward. Uh, when the boom's on the center line, it'd be, you know, we should probably sail these boats a little more like, say, a fin or a laser where the boom's down quite a bit. I think cat rig boats need help going forward. And, and if your traveler's down a couple inches off center line, I don't think that's a big deal because I think that helps the boat to go forward. Does it hurt pointing? I don't think so. You know, when we, we were, you know, we're more aggressive with the traveler all the way to the bottom than anyone in the fleet. And the comment always is, because I always bring it up in these conversations, people see us sail. And I was like, well, you must be suffering from pointing, and we are never suffering from pointing. The boat's going faster forward. When the boat goes fast, it helps give you a height. Do any of our wayfarer sales, sailors have any questions? <laughs> well, what about mass rate? You guys both similar settings or where are you at for um i usually go 28 four to 28 four and a half and maybe even four and three quarters um so i'm not sure where i think the, what the the main standard there a long time ago i think was three and a half or something like that is that what it is yeah, yeah so um so i i have a little bit less range right um but uh and I like to take rake out when the wind comes on. And I know I've heard other theories that uh, people say they increase rake, or the scow theories were that you add rake with more wind. But that was against what I'm used to doing on boats that you take rake out or move the rake forward in more breeze to reduce how. So but you, I don't know where you you're move at. it forward in more breeze. So yeah, I tight. I that straight. You know, ass, sometimes then... I might go a little further forward. Yeah. Right. Just straighten the mast and then um, the well it might make the mast a little stiffer but then uh, I'll just put more bang on it, so right. I'll still bend the mast That's right yeah I, I think that the number is again way way down the priority list on the MC we're at the maybe in the four range and when we talk about rake, you know moving rake around in this class and a lot of other classes we're talking about moving the rake four and a half a couple of inches but I think it's irrelevant to how the boat sails. In some classes, you know, I used to race 470s around and you race Flying Dutchman. Smaller boats, well, the 470 is about the size of this boat, we would be moving the rake around a foot and a half, depending on the wind conditions. And in the FD, you had four hole adjustments for the Genoa clue because you're moving the rake so far, fore and aft, that the Genoa wouldn't sheet unless you changed the, 
the uh, sheet position on, on the clue of the jib. And so when you're talking about moving rakes four and a half about a foot, well, it matters as far as uh, the balance of the boat. But when we're describing whether we should be at 28.3 or 28.5, don't worry about it. We could, I mean, I don't know, I can't, I don't know about the 470, but to go along with what you just said on the Flying Dutchman, we could also move the centerboard four and aft in the trunk about 18 inches. Right. So we yeah. could compensate. If we brought the rig way back, we'd slide the board back on the track and maybe even have the board up a couple inches. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can't move the board four and aft, then you can't really play with your rake a lot. Yeah. When you start getting in the weeds and start discussing about a rake over position of a couple of inches, I, I'm probably focusing on the wrong thing. I right. just kind of zero in where basically everyone else is and leave it. Because you can offset that with main sheet trim or whatever else. It's just, we're not talking else. about moving the rake four and a half a foot. You know, right. we're talking a couple inches. It's just not that relevant.